As part of LFA 2022, we're sharing five news stories exploring the key people and projects shaping the Royal Docks. From City Hall and Kamal Chunchi Way, to Tate and Lyle, the Factory Project, and London Design and Engineering UTC. We hope by listening to these conversations, you'll learn more about both the history and present day of the Royal Docks. This series followed on from our Power Podcast series in 2020, which explored and celebrated the hidden yet fundamental infrastructure site at the heart of keeping the Royal Docks running. For our fourth conversation, we're exploring Tate and Lyle and the unexpected future of sugar in the Royal Docks. To start with, I'm joined by Chris Abel, Head of Property and Local Affairs at Tate and Lyle Sugars. After, I'll be joined by two individuals from the University of East London, Alan Chandler, Dean of Research, and Armel Gutierrez-Rivas, Senior Lecturer. So to start with, Chris, could you introduce yourself and your connection to Tate and Lyle? Hi, I'm um, Chris Abel. I'm the Head of Property and Local Affairs for Tate and Lyle Sugars. I've worked for Tate and Lyle for about five years. My role encompasses a really interesting and broad range of different topics and responsibilities at Tet and Lyle, but I think the most interesting are probably real estate and town planning from a Royal Docks perspective. I look after a small on-site museum we have, which I'm very enthusiastic about, which looks at the history of Tet and Lyle. And I also handle a lot of our relationships in the community alongside colleagues. We've been here in the Royal Docks for 144 years and we're really proud to play a big role in the community. So we have some really deep and important connections there as well. Amazing. So I think you're the perfect person to be talking to about the history of Tate and Lyle then in that case. And I think that's a great place to start the conversation. So what is Tate and Lyle? Where did it start and how did it end up in the Royal Docks? So I'll, I'll try and keep it to the abridged version because you could do a sort of six part podcast on this. But if we split it into Mr. Tate and Mr. Lyle and start from there. So Henry Tate was originally a greengrocer in Liverpool and he built up a relatively successful chain of greengrocers shops where he sold a fair amount of sugar. And in the sort of late 1850s, he decided to take a bit of a risk and try and move actually into the sugar refining and sugar production um, industry. And he became a partner in a sugar refinery in 1859. Over the years, that went very well. And by 1878, he wanted to expand into the larger and more prosperous London market. And he bought what was then a derelict shipyard. And today is the Thames refinery that you can see from the London City Airport DLR. And here we are today. His key sort of, or one of his biggest achievements, should we say, was introducing the sugar cube to the UK. So he bought the patents for the sugar cube off a German uh, inventor called Eugene Langen in the 1870s. And it was a really, really clever business move because at the time you had a real problem with things like the adulteration of foods in that kind of Victorian era. People, for example, with sugar, people would mix like chalk dust into it and other horrible stuff. You also mainly bought sugar and you would have done this in Henry's grocer shops originally from something called sugar loaves, which are like big cones of sugar and that was the way sugar was refined at the time and it was actually quite inconvenient for the housewife you know or the end consumer buying it It was sort of broken off in lumps and sold by weight when you got a cube you had something which was a convenient kind of single use portion that was actually easy to drop into a cup of tea or could work in a recipe and you could also tell that it came from a factory it'd been untampered with no one had put anything in it you knew it hadn't been interfered with or adulterated and a major part of the success of Thames Refinery in those early years was using that, that sugar cube process and the popularity of that cube in the UK that displaced really the sugar loaf and became the main or the preferred way of buying sugar. So that's Mr. Tate. Mr. Lyle, and many people will know the little, what's now a smaller factory, the little Lyle's Golden Syrup factory that you can see by West Silvertown DLR. You can see a big green tin on the side of the factory if you're going past on the DLR. Um, He was originally in the shipping business very successfully in Scotland, and he received essentially as payment for a debt, um, a a load of raw sugar. And from that, he basically got into the refining business in Scotland, but he, he only ever really had a share of a bit of a factory and he kind of wanted to really give it a go himself. And he decided 
rather than do it up in Greenock, where he was already based, his shipping business based, a bit like Mr. Tate, he decided that the place to do this is somewhere in the east end of London. You're closest to the biggest market. You can be on the river to receive cargoes of raw sugar. And he purchased a couple of wharves. I think in 1881, he purchased a couple of wharves. And a couple of years later, um, another refinery opened up, one and about a mile down the road from Henry Tate's Thames refinery, which we call Plasto or Plasto Wharf. And he got going very successfully. His big product, what he was best known for, was Lyle's Golden Syrup, which is still one of our best products. It's probably our best product today. It's what we're best known for. And it's an absolutely unique product with elements of a secret recipe to it as well. He essentially realized as part of the sugar refining process that there was something called jets, which is a sort of byproduct of turning raw sugar into white sugar. And he realized this, this liquid contained a lot of sugar and a lot of flavor in it. But it, at the moment, it was being thrown away. And he employed three Scottish brothers, so two Scottish brothers, sorry, called the Eastick brothers, who were some of the best chemists in the world at the time working in the city of London. He said, I want you to work on this and turn it into something um, which will be a nice product. And not only did they turn it into a nice product, they turned it into something that was absolutely delicious. And I won't go into all of the secret processes around that, partially because I, I don't actually know. We only have about seven people in the in the world who know that, all of whom are based at Plaster Wharf, but essentially found a way to turn this dark brown, kind of watery, sugary byproduct into a sort of delicious, thick golden syrup. And we still sell it very successfully today. Every single drop of Lyle's golden syrup ever made has been made at that site in the Royal Docks. Amazing. And I think I've got some Lyle's golden syrup in my cupboard right now, um, which I think can tell you how much it really is in everyone's cupboard. And you just mentioned about the history and quite a few years of history there, but it's still up and running today. The factory's still there, still working, still producing things, if I understand correctly. Yeah. I mean, well, that's just the beginning. So, I mean, you've got another, you know, 140 years of history that we're very proud of from then onwards. It wasn't, for example, until 1921 that this was the grandchildren of Mr. Tate and Mr. Lyle decided Tate to the masters of the cubes, Lyle's are the masters of the golden syrup. Instead of being rivals, maybe we should be friends. And they merged together in, in 1921. But that rivalry still persisted for a number of years. People used to say, I work at Tate's, I work at Lyle's, meaning the two different factories. I even, when I started working at Technol, I got in a black cab once and the <laughs> taxi driver went, is it the Tate's or the Lyle's you're going to? So that's still, you know, 130 something years later, that difference has still survived. Uh, yeah, and then there's, you know, it's, it's, we see ourselves almost as a microcosm of British history here. You've got all sorts of tales, you know, whether it's scientific and industrial history, you know, the innovation of the cube and the golden syrup, but more broadly, you've got things like combined heat and heat and power um, began in the sugar industry. Um, you know, at the moment, sustainability is a really big issue at the moment. And we're looking at moving away from natural gas, which is our main source of power, to alternative fuel supplies. Over to, That's a very difficult process and it will take a while. But I was looking back in our company magazine from an issue in 1972 and front page story that we were really proud of was moving from coal to natural gas as our main um, source of power. So it, it, the company is just replete with all sorts of history. Um, you know, in terms of social history, I mentioned the company magazine. We've got every single copy of that in our museum. It's also stored in Stratford Library, if any of the listeners would like to go and have a look at it, which is easier to access. You know, that ran from over 50 years um, and you've got these lovely stories in that. I mean, it's quite funny looking at it. You've got columns like Thames Gossip, for like, the gossip that was going on in, in the factory. And in the post-war years, we employed, you know, several thousand people across um, East London. Most of them would have been within walking distance for a short bus ride to the factory. Um, you had generations of whole families would work here. People would very commonly meet their partner, their husband or their wife at work. That would get a little mention in the magazine. You had all sorts of clubs and social activities across the road from us. We've got the Tate Institute, which was established by Henry Tate in 1897. I think were supposedly for the industrial classes of Silvertown to relax. I think that was at functions as a Tate and Lyle social club for years and, and a social club for the local community and used, you know, uh, subsidised bar, dances, children's Christmas parties, dart and snooker competitions in there. We used to have a large sports ground. Again, that was just on the fringes of the sort of Royal Docks as well, where we'd have a annual sports day, cricket teams, football teams. That went on for years. So there's a really quite deep and rich social history. It's a bit different now, but we still have some people 
who can um, trace back multiple generations working for us, less than would have been the case 30 or 40 years ago. But there's a really rich social history as well. And then um, occasionally we've played our part in sort of more broader kind of national and political history. We've got our famous character, Mr. Cube, who was invented in... um, 1949. He was invented to essentially campaign against nationalisation, which the Labour government of the time was looking to nationalise a large number of industries, Clement Attlee's government, including the cane refining section of the sugar industry. The the beet section was already essentially government owned and he featured on your sugar ration book holder. He had all sorts of phrases like kill that snake state and the state will leave a hole in your packet of sugar and all sorts of little phrases like this. There were little dice games for children to play he appeared on the packets of sugar with all these phrases as well and part of the logic of that was that reached exactly the audience you wanted to care about this and you wanted to influence and and then to put pressure on politicians which at the time in the 50s was you know the housewife doing the weekly shopping so there's all these little different I'm only just scratched the surface there um, and there's all these little different pockets and patches of history you know related to these two factories that we're still very proud are still going here in the um, in the Royal Dock to this day. Amazing and I think it's a lot of history that people are familiar with and particularly I think the brand of Tate and Lyle most people in the in the UK and beyond will probably be aware of but probably not aware of the history that comes alongside that uh, which is found fascinating and then just thinking about it in the context of where it is the Royal Docks is an area of so much change transformation how over 100 plus years has the change within the Royal Docks affected both the factories on people on the buildings what has those changes been like and how has the factory sort of adapted to those changes yeah I mean it's a really good question that we're quite rare in the sense that there was a change in in the it was almost a deindustrialization is probably the right way to look at it particularly in the docks of east London that affected the royal docks but also further up river but what is now canary wharf and even further up than that, things like St. Catherine's Docks and many of the wharves on either side of the river, you essentially went through this, this process of containerization where rather than goods essentially being hand unloaded by dockers, most things were now packed into steel containers and unloaded in containers by cranes rather than coming as a sort of loose cargo. There are a few reasons as to why we were able to and continue to be where we are. One of those is that we... Prior to the process of containerization, we shifted to bulk sugar imports. So essentially the sugar travels, or bulk carriers is probably the right way to put it, the sugar travels inside the hull of a ship as a raw material. So a raw sugar travels inside the hull of the ship, and then we unload that using cranes. It looks a bit like brown sugar. It is basically very similar to brown sugar. And that those bulk carriers could be carrying coal or iron ore or, or something else the week before. So we weren't affected in the same way by containerization as a number of our kind of peers or or similar industries were across and around the docks Uh, and we moved quickly towards that in the 50s um, because we were quite innovative in the late 50s early early 60s further to that sugar refinery is not only incredibly complex it's also incredibly expensive to build so unlike some other economic or industrial activities the economics of us moving is very different the cost of rebuilding a sugar refinery isn't necessarily paid back by selling land, um, if that makes sense. And you'd have to find appropriate sites for Tate and Lyle to move to. You'd have to find somewhere where we could have big ocean going ships. Um, you'd need to find 20 acres of, of land and it needs to be close to our customers. And then thirdly, I would say, very importantly, we also consider the Royal Docks to be our home. We consider Thames and Plaster, we've been here a very long time. It suits us and we still don't see no reason to leave it's actually been a very good home to us and we like being here we play a large role in the Royal Docks and particularly with Newham and and the community wealth building program there so we like being here in terms of the sort of changes aspect of your question much of the sort of evolution uh the the refinery's grown up sort of higgledy piggledy I I mentioned how complex it was and how how expensive it is to rebuild that's because it's grown up higgledy piggledy bit by bit over over 144 44 years so when people go past it on the DLR they will go oh that looks very complicated and bits that look like they're from the Victorian era and bits that look like they're from the 1950s and, and some bits look really modern and that is actually the case so we've slowly and gently adapted um, over the years the broad sort of process I suppose has been towards 
more uh, automation and then in recent years more computerization yeah and i suppose the other big change for us is that plasto wharf Lars god and syrup factory did used to be a full size sugar refinery as big as thames refinery so that's the smaller golden syrup factory near west west silvertown and we did consolidate that in the uh, mid 60s we did consolidate most of the refining at thames refinery so at thames refinery we have about a 50 acre site and at plaster wharf it's about a, a 3.5 acre site well that's a quite a big space is it taken up yeah. in the docks then and are they all still running batteries or some of them have been used for different things today how does that look I mean, it's it's fascinating from a sort of land and real estate and town planning perspective and how you work, you know, also with our core business, you know, manufacturing sugar production, transport of sugar, raw material sugar in by ship. But the short answer is, yeah, both are still running working factories and really, really important. I mean, the Plasto Wharf, people go past that and go, oh, that's, and we've had this before with property developers going, oh, that's a dusty old factory, that's, that'll be closed down soon, um, you know, and two years and a planning battle later they accept what you said to them in the first place that this is actually a really really important um factory where every single drop of glass golden syrup has been made there it's actually the most profitable site in the entire global group we're part of and the reason it looks quite dusty from the outside is uh, you know and a bit bit rough around the edges is because you spend the money inside on having the best machinery, the best technology, the highest safety, the highest food quality standards, etc. At Thames, it's a little bit different. As I mentioned, very big um, land area there, about 50 acres. We do uh, there, again, have significant issues with residential property developers not quite understanding that this factory is here to stay. It is industrial, it is noisy, and the people who move into their apartments have every right to have a high quality piece of uh, housing or apartment and an appropriate understanding that they're moving close to a uh, noisy industrial process. But we do have some bits. We've done some quite interesting things within that 50 acre site. It's about somewhere between two thirds to sort of four fifths, um, I would say, is core sugar refining activities. Um, but we've expanded a bit over the years. We talked about some industrial businesses moving out. We've bought bits of land and either side. And I think there's two or three things which are really, really interesting. I think you'll be speaking with some people who are aware of some of the changes we've made recently around sort of land and real estate on some of those fringe areas of the Thames refinery estate. And I think these capture really nice the sort of evolution we're going through so I think you're due to speak with Eric Samuel MBE of Community Food Enterprises now he's been a, a very long-standing charity partner of ours who occupies a warehouse on the western end of the Thames refinery um, estate he provides about 135,000 meals per year in and around East London he essentially sources and collects in his warehouse prepares and then delivers food to a really wide variety of community centres and food banks and really any organisation who are distributing to people in need. He's been there 20 years and it's absolutely perfect for him because what he needs is a decent sized um, warehouse with a supportive long-term landlord who would be given the space for free and he likes being in somewhere which is you know a big vans and big truck can turn up. The focus is on space and, and racking that's what he needs. So yeah I mean that, that's an example of something we've done for a long time where we have a bit of excess space and it reflects you know the quite long-standing community commitments we have and it's something we're really proud of not that we want there to be which is with food poverty in East London but unfortunately there are and it's wonderful to be able to do something really substantive and important and it's also important to recognize some of the other partners he's got in the Royal Docks at the Excel Centre have been very supportive of him London City Airport really supportive of him as well um, and then the part of the site Eric sits in is actually part of a broader sort of roughly five acre site which had some dilapidated and rundown buildings in it and some buildings that we used until relatively recently for sugar storage but you know we've listened and, and looked at things like the London plan and the Newham local plan about trying to intensify industrial land make sure industrial land is put into intense economic use at the best value for for that and it also makes economic sense for us and one and I think you'll also be speaking to Nick Hartwright who runs the very successful silver building and also is running a project on that area I'm talking about at Tate and Lyle called the factory project so he's in partnership with himself and the Raw Docks team to start a factory project down on this five acres and it will bring about 100,000 square foot of, of industrial buildings plus a couple of acres of good quality open space yards back into that kind of economic use that I'm talking 
talking about. And what's great about Nick and his team at Project is that they do things that just isn't a skill set as a sugar refiner. They're able to bring in these kind of cool, trendy, creative maker industries, modern kind of light industrial stuff, everything from I saw an enormous dragon being built up there uh, yesterday and, and being filmed out in one of the yards. We've had the mayor of London down launching the living wage rates. Um, Eric's received an upgrade to his warehouse. We've had one of London's must-see art shows down there. And I know some, I'm also involved in the new Chamber of Commerce. We've got some really interesting small businesses at the moment. I don't know exact stages of this looking to move in there as well. So it's just a fascinating project, the factory project. Sure, Nick will tell you more about it. It's something we're really pleased to partner with him and the Royal Docks. And we think it's a really good example of how as a big older style industrial landowner you can find quite interesting and exciting ways to use your land and to play a positive role in the regeneration of the royal docks and then i just make a final point on that people often think uh, of regeneration basically as just building a load of flats and turning disused or underused office buildings or industrial buildings into modern flats but we're really passionate about seeing what i'd call genuine sort of mixed use regeneration here in the Royal Docks. You know, we think it's really well poised for that. You've got people like ourselves who've been here a very, very long time. You've got things like UEL, who've got some fascinating um, research going on. You've got some of the newer developments, things like Albert Islands um, as well, who've got significant um, industrial space. And and rightly, there is a housing crisis. You've got some fantastic new residential developments um, coming up, some of which have already, already been delivered. And I think it's really interesting to see how this area will uh, develop and how that mix of uses I think can knit together and you have not just houses but also hopefully some really good quality jobs and you and you know maybe even dare I say it some Tate and Lyles of tomorrow who might be here in 140 years time doing a podcast. Some really exciting times and it's so interesting to hear that so much going on in what you might think is just Tate and Lyles factory where sugar is made but actually there's so much going on and so much Space that's being used that could have been lost, maybe, or just not used. It'd be interesting to get your thoughts on what's the importance of reviving spaces and not leaving warehouses just empty and actually allowing the community around to use it and really sort of giving back to the community in which the factories sit. Yeah, I think it's something we've become more aware of over recent years. I mean, one thing I do think is worth saying is we've been involved in something recently called the Industrial Land uh, Commission, which brought together a number of different industrial, I think probably users of industrial land in London is probably the right way to look at it. Everything from small manufacturers of trays through to the sort of big industrial property developers through to food manufacturers like Archers. And something I've experienced running sort of uh, real estate and town planning work streams here at Tatenwild is how many calls I get from s- small and medium-sized businesses in and around East London, you know, everything from, you know, little food startups to um, garages, which have been running for 30 years to scrap metal yards, all sorts, um, who are just being put under pressure and they're, where their base is essentially being turned over to residential development. And one of the reasons we've started this partnership with the Factory Project was because it was a way to provide opportunities for those types of businesses. And that's not just a Tet and Lyle thing. You can see the docks being a, a really good place of growth for those SMEs. It's really well positioned for it. You've got the Silver Building I mentioned, next other projects alongside the Factory Project. We've also got something called Expressway under the sort of Silvertown uh, flyover again, which is a slightly different, but a whole suite of small businesses based there. And I think it's really interesting the way the docks is providing maybe a bit of a release valve for some of that, some of the businesses being displaced from elsewhere in London. I think more space is needed, but yeah, I think it's a really um, important issue. Yeah. I think it is, and it'd be really interesting. I think that's looking even in one year, but five, 10 years time, um, I think it's going to be really interesting. And you mentioned just before a podcast in 140 years. What's the future going to look like, do you think, for Tate and Lyle? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things I'd say, but I think I mentioned briefly earlier decarbonisation. I think sustainability is an absolutely massive theme in society in general at the moment. And we are essentially an energy intensive industry. We've got, I think, one of the biggest power stations. I think we might have the biggest or the second biggest power station within inside the N25 that we use to turn raw sugar into white sugar. And that's a real, it's both a challenge, but it's also a fantastic opportunity. And I'm really excited about a number of different things we're doing it in that regard. And I think sustainability broadly rather than just focus on the carbon side of things is really um interesting um 
for example, we have various different byproducts at the refinery. We've got something called calcium carbonate cake, which comes out of part of the factory during a sort of filtration and decolorization process called carbonatation um, that happens as part of the sugar refining process. We found some really interesting ways to put that to use. And we look, we're actually in some conversations at the moment about whether we might be able to do some of this directly in the docks of Newham, which would be absolutely fantastic. But one that's up and running is we've worked with a um, council who's looking to create butterfly banks and essentially we provide them with the calcium carbonate cake they lay it down on the ground in a relatively wide area of sort of grassland marshland golf courses the calcium carbonate cake is perfect to make chalky soil and there are certain plants which grow on chalky soil and these are the only plants that certain butterflies eat so we've in south london we've got i think it's something like 25 butterfly banks have been established using a byproduct from our refinery, which I hope I've explained that well enough, but it's just extraordinary to me and just such a cool story of the circular economy. Similar project, same byproduct, calcium carbonate cake, can also be used to give bricks in, in brick manufacturing, to give bricks a slightly yellow tinge, which certain types of London brick, uh, you quite often see them in Victorian terraced houses, they have that sort of yellowy tinge and traditionally that came from something called fire clay which came out of coal mines and we're running out of that in the UK and but if you use calcium carbonate instead of fire clay you can recreate the same colour and finish for the bricks and we've actually done that again successfully with a company called York had made bricks we've made tens of thousands of those bricks Finally, on the calcium carbonate cake, I've already given you two uses, but again, I think I'm right in saying you'll soon be speaking with UEL, and that's a great cross-docs collaboration our research and technology department does with them, um, sort of innovative building materials. They'll be able to explain it much better than me, but that's, you know, just free uses of one of our byproducts, and no doubt we'll find more, possibly with, with help from UEL. Amazing, and I think there's so much history, but also present and future projects that are going on I think people will be fascinated to hear about now for the first time but then also keep their eyes peeled as well on how they've moved forward in the future I know I personally am I think we're coming up to the end of our time is there one final thing that you'd want people to know about Tate and Lyle I mentioned decarbonisation and that is going to be a big challenge for us over the coming years. But I can't go into all the details of it, but we've got lots of work streams on that and we're very confident that we will make big progress in that regard and be able to move in the medium or longer term away from primarily fossil fuels. At the same time, we've got loads of efficiency projects going on to reduce our energy consumption. That's always something you're trying to do. You're always trying to reduce your energy consumption, but they're even more important now. And then I suppose the Royal Docks is our home, and I think we will see some significant development on our site related to sugar as well. I think over time, there will be new processes and probably new warehousing needed as well. So I think there will be continue to be significant investment in the sites in the coming years. And I suppose more broadly, we make about a quarter of the UK sugar at the site at the moment, which we're very proud of. And I think we'd like to continue that, grow that. And we've got some fantastic, what we call it MPD, new product development, but we've in recent years brought out some really interesting products, things like coffee syrups. If you go and get a, you know, hazelnut latte or a gingerbread latte at these coffee shops is a very good chance you're having a technical coffee syrup There's all the research and the science behind that and the kind of product development and marketing all of that's happened here in, in the royal docks you know in the labs we've got here with the experts we've got here so you know it's, we're confident we're, we're and there's an awful lot more going on behind the walls of these big factories than people realize sometimes what a great place to end well, thank you for chatting to us, Chris. I think we definitely all learned something there. And I think what a nice way to lead into the next conversation, which is actually honing in on one of those projects which has been mentioned. So I'm now joined by Alan and Amor from the University of East London. Could you give us a little introduction to yourself, but also to the project? Hello everyone, my name is Armor and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of East London, where I'm teaching a group of master's students for already five years and a few years ago we started a very exciting collaboration with the Royal Docks uh, where we were researching local industries and how we could look into empowering uh, the new green industries that are being created around the Royal Docks and we started collaborating with the Tate and Lyle which uh, has uh, one of the main facilities uh, very close to Royal Docks and very close to where our university is located 
and that's how I got involved in the project. Thanks, Amor. I'm Alan Chandler. I have been teaching uh, architecture, technology and professional studies for ooh, 20 years or so. And uh, I initiated at the school the Idea of Life projects as part of the, uh, the MR program. And so when Amor came to me with the sort of the potential for uh, some of the materiality that his students and he have come up with in their studio program, um, I immediately wanted to kind of bring that into the, the idea of the workshops. So every year we do these kind of workshops, which bring uh, clients and uh, issues and students together to kind of uh, work together and solve problems and innovate. And so we, we brought the Construction Week project to bear on the discoveries that his students have made and we helped develop to the next level this potential material that we've come up with with Tate and Lyle. So, so yeah, I'm very pleased to work with Armour as always. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with him and his students. And uh, yeah, now I'm the Dean of Research at UEL. It allows me to leverage other kind of aspects of research into the program. So yeah, taking it forward to to the next level. Amazing. So for people who don't know about the project, what is the project you've been working on? What's the material that you found? We have been working for, I think it's already almost two years with the byproducts from sugar industry. So there is a large uh, network of uh, sugarcane plantations and uh, Tate and Lyle uh, collaborates with the different countries uh, around the world. So the aim was to kind of find uh, new materials that could be used for construction, both locally where the plantations are located and also elsewhere, such as uh, Europe or UK, and use that waste that is generated on the sugarcane plantations to create new construction materials that can be used for insulation, for cladding, for load bearing capacities. Uh, we are still exploring the possibilities, but the idea is that everything is based on, on waste products that gets uh, reused into something different. I think you've just hinted upon it a little bit, but how did you discover the material and the, the possibilities that it had? Yeah, it's, uh, it sort of comes from being nosy, I guess. Uh, and it's something that we try and encourage our students to do um, is just to kind of start digging at whatever they're given, whether that's a, an urban situation or a building or a set of issues. And so I think the, the idea of inventing materials is something which we're really keen on because it's a kind of an initial starting point that the students have, be it a kind of waste product or a kind of residue or an excess of something. And so the kind of the, the intellectual challenge challenge is to sort of take whatever it is and do something useful with it and the more critically you look at something the more detailed you look at it the more opportunities you find and so instilling that sense of curiosity in the students is really critical so uh, as soon as you start looking around you and you start seeing there's an excess of something here or there's a byproduct of something there the ability to interrogate that and to start putting things together and to start solving new problems with this is something that we always really encourage. So yeah, some of the students got their, got their teeth into, well, literally teeth into waste sugar. And from those early experiments, you begin to see opportunities. So that's what we encourage with our students, just bringing them on and bringing them a sort of a sense of enthusiasm with materials and with what you can do with them. So you can eventually solve two or three problems with one idea. I think that's something quite interesting as well is when the students get into the tactility of the project and when they see the material not just as a concept but when they start touching the material, exploring it, realizing that it has a very beautiful appearance and tactility and start to kind of making small prototypes and small models with it. That's something that we encourage quite a lot to our students and it's something quite unique of our university that is not only using that potential that the material has, but also realizing that the material can become something quite beautiful in their projects. Is that a way of working that you've done quite a bit with the university, or is it a new way of working? Because obviously it's very collaborative with the students and teachers and professors. How does that relationship work? Is it something that you've done before or something you tried for the first time with this project? No, it's, it's something that we've really worked on for years. It comes from a, a kind of deep-seated interest in the way materials work and how they contribute to architecture. And it's something that I brought with my ex-tutor, Peter Salter, who was running the school when I started. And we were really encouraging the students to not think of architecture as drawings, which you then hand to a builder, but something that you have to understand fundamentally in order to be able to communicate accurately to contractors, to clients, to planners, to whoever, the users. So that it's only by really understanding what you're talking about can you actually really 
get people to also understand what you need and what the building has to be. So the aspect of materiality is really, really present in what we teach. And it's something that we've been using these live workshops um, over the years to kind of instill in students. In, in our MARC, we get a lot of students who haven't learned with us before coming into the school. So coming together around material invention, processes, tactility, qualities of material, performance of materials right at the start of their master's journey with us is really key because it kind of sets the tone. It kind of sets the agenda for them. And then that's something that we reinforce through the studio work for the next two years until they get their RBA part twos. I think it's a really interesting way of working in something I think that could be replicated slightly more in other places as well, which is really interesting. And you mentioned architecture beyond drawing. And I guess on that point, it's a waste of material. Is sustainability something that was a driving force? Is it something that just came across as you've discovered this material, where does it fit into sort of those conversations? We are always encouraging the students to understand the complexity of selecting a material. And when you come into practice, it's something that you just kind of select from a website or that you just kind of write the name and that's the material that is applied to a very large scheme. And knowing the implications of those materials, the carbon footprint that they have, the U values that they have, and the impact that the material is going to have in, in our environment, we think that is key to what architecture represents uh, nowadays. So for us, it's more about them knowing that the material is something that you need to be very careful with, whether the material is going to be exposed and is going to be the finish of the building or whether it's going to be the insulation, understanding all the layers that go into construction and making sure that you are aware that all of them have an impact in our built environment. And it's not only necessarily about environmental, which is very important, but it's also about social sustainability. So how can we allow people to kind of empower themselves by using certain materials, by understanding that those materials have potential to build not only here where we are based with the university, but elsewhere in the world. And to me, something that the students take, which I'm, I'm quite, uh, whenever I hear the students uh, finding jobs in practice and coming back to us saying, when I did the interview, they were very impressed by our social and environmental agenda. They were very impressed by, not necessarily because everybody comes out of the university creating a new material, but like just the thinking that is behind it, like that curiosity, that kind of pushing forward, the way we understand architecture. That's something that, at least from my experience, my students got very valued from employers and from people that got in touch with them uh, after once they graduated. So I think that there is, there is a need for this type of research and this type of commitment from the students and from academia towards new materials, towards being more careful with what we select and what we use. Yeah, I think it's about provenance. I think, I think it's increasingly becoming an issue, you know, the issues of embodied carbon, issues of ethical kind of inputs into the way the materials are sourced, uh, processed, distributed, uh, recycled. So the whole kind of circular economy question isn't some sort of abstract kind of intellectual sort of indulgence. It's actually a complete reality. And the students need to understand why things matter in order to tell clients and funders why they matter so that they are getting the best value for their expenditure. The life cycle of a building, how long does it last? How adaptable is it? What do you do with it when you've finished with it? If we can't answer those questions and if the students can't be thinking about those questions, then, then we're all in trouble. So I think, you know, getting that sort of sense of responsibility right at the outset, you know, what does the building got to do? What's it got to be made of? What are you going to do with it after 50 years? Those kind of questions are sort of questions that often aren't asked. And a lot of the kind of the slightly more floral and um, pretty kind of competition winning schemes from schools of architecture, they kind of miss the point. They're not really taking responsibility for what happens next. And I think, you know, call us pragmatists or realists, or I'd actually think we're, we're slightly romantic in the way that we think materials matter. And I think that there's a huge space uh, in architectural education for the role of materials and the kind of responsibility that specification has. And it's not a sort of dull thing that isn't pretty or attractive. It's actually becomes the reality of architecture. So getting students excited about that is really key. Because in the end, that's where you get the most interesting architecture, the most interesting buildings, I think. 
Definitely. So there's a real combination of creativity, science, what's going on with the world. It's not just architecture with a capital A. There's a lot of sort of interdisciplinary ideas and thoughts and research going on. Is that something that you work on quite a bit? Do you work with other departments within the university? That's a very good question, Eliza, and, and the answer is yes. <laughs> and I think that's one of the main reasons why this project has been successful or or is leading into something that is quite exciting. And I think that it's not only us pushing the students to engage with our departments, but also making them aware that the possibilities of universities in UK, and at least myself coming from Spain, where the universities are much more segregated here, normally it's very easy to work with different departments and with different disciplines. And everybody's open to these collaborations. Like it seems that the students are a bit shy sometimes into going out and trying to reach out to other disciplines. But I think that when that happens, it leads always to something very interesting. From my experience with our students at the university, uh, whenever somebody tries to engage with somebody from other department, whether it's uh, engineering or um, art, uh, which is very close to where we are in, in architecture, we are sharing the building with them. And there are so many facilities that are available for the students that most of the times they don't know about them. So I think that this short of very engaging two weeks programs that we run at the beginning of the year, uh, which Alan was explaining before, which we call the construction week, is very good for that because we kind of open up the university for two years where all the departments are open to all the students. And then it's just up to the student to see how much do they want to push and how much do they want to research. For instance, this project, we started uh, working within architecture, but then we started collaborating with the Sustainability Research Institute, which is another partner of the project that has been helping us a lot. Uh, there is one material scientist, Bamdat, who is an integral part of the project as well. And he's been helping us with understanding how is the material made, how is the reaction that creates the material. And when the students look at the material in the microscope for the first time, they saw an incredible universe that they will never think it could be mine and exist. And out of that image that they got out of the microscope, they kind of turned that into a pattern that then was applied into a facade. So I think that there is so much hidden within materiality that you can unravel just by collaborating with different disciplines. And of course, uh, then there is more pragmatic questions. So once the material is created or once you start working with materials that are a bit more innovative, what do you need to do to make that material real? Uh, what do you need to test? We have a U-value to test the thermal conductivity of the material, and that's something that we had in the university for many years, but architecture as students were not using it as much. So we are pushing them to know that that's your responsibility, to understand how your material will perform in terms of kind of uh, heating and, and cooling, and the same for fire, the same for compression, and all those facilities are there. So once the student understand that they are there to be used. Now I have maybe five or six students that have kind of branched out from the initial project and each one is testing something slightly different and all of them are collaborating with all this without our supervision anymore because they know that they can. So I think that that's quite special to see how things can evolve out of an initial idea. Yeah, I think it's that sort of need to know idea. I think that curiosity, as I mentioned before, is, is really key. And the balancing of science and art in doing that, I think, is really critical. You know, architecture is this weird discipline that hovers in between the two and sort of it's neither but both. So we've on the one hand got a material scientist who's breaking down to a molecular level what the material's doing. And on the other hand, we've got the textiles staff in the art school showing the students how to create different colored dyes from from plant fibers so that you could apply that to the mixes so you can actually color the product using natural dyes. So you've got this kind of amazing set of potentials that students can become excited about. And I think the key thing is to make sure that quite regularly you've got students producing this kind of work so that it wakes everybody else up and they start looking over their shoulders going, oh, hang on a minute, how come they're having fun? What's, what's going on? And so I think that's part of the joy of my new role, which is as Dean of Research. I end up getting involved in, in everybody's research, psychology or the health and bioscience or fine art, and seeing the opportunities to bring them all together with our architecture students so that the architecture students can see that you know, architecture as a sort of social art can connect to people in ways even more diverse than just making buildings. And that sometimes it's also about what those buildings can do, what those spaces can achieve, what events they can make. And so really giving the students this sort of rounded sense of what collaboration can lead to, I think is, is really key. I think that sounds really 
amazing and I wonder whether it's something that I wish I had when I was studying myself I think it sounds like such an interesting way of working in they're just thinking about shifting slightly outside of the university to the application of this I know you're still in the testing phase you're still sort of uh, understanding the material but have you thought at all about what this could mean for the future of the industry and buildings both I guess locally so you're based in the Royal Docks so what that could mean to the Royal Docks but also to the rest of the UK to Europe to the world have you thought about that at all? I think that's the genuinely exciting bit about this material. You know, its origins in the global south where sugarcane is, is planted and, and harvested. You know, quite often the residues are just burnt. They either make electricity or they just burn it because it's just a waste product, right? So with a material that can harness that potential and find a different purpose for it to actually create materials that locally can be used to make um, valuable building materials can then be sold to create local sources of revenue and income, can then be deployed and reused, recycled uh, locally. You're looking at a material that can have great benefit where it comes from. Then there's the potential for people locally there to export, to be able to create larger revenue streams for the more privileged North Hemisphere to be able to get products that are completely sustainable, that that hold more carbon than they've ever released. That kind of exchange across hemispheres is the really exciting bit about this material. So in the end, it benefits not just the, the shareholders of the company, but it actually benefits a wider sort of community right down to grassroots level. And the nice thing about working with Tate and Lyle is that they take their corporate social responsibility really rather seriously. So they were immediately keen on exploring the idea of patents, but not so much to make money out of them more to secure the ability to be able to use that material for that kind of global purpose. So I think it's quite exciting when you can get a group of people around a material that it's not actually so much about profit, it's about benefit. And I think that's where it gets really exciting. And that's a really good message for the students to take, that your practice as an architect isn't simply about delivering profit for an investor, but it's also about the kind of the, the wider set of values that any kind of work that you do can bring. And I think you just touched on it slightly, the sort of what's next for the project. You mentioned the patent, but it'd be wonderful to hear about what you're hoping to do next. Yeah, so as um, you mentioned, Eliza and Alan touched before as well, we are in the process of trying to patent the material and trying to kind of secure the use of the material, not only for us, but for uh, third countries where it's produced. And that comes with a quite a process because you need to not, not only engage with the patent process, but at the same time, in parallel, you need to run a number of tests that every material that can come into the market it requires. One of the main ones that we are developing at the moment is fire. So making sure that the material is fire tested. We have done internally fire testing in our facilities, which uh, they have very promising results, but now we need to get the actual rating. And because it's a new material, it's not that straightforward. It's hard to find the facilities that understand that this is a material which is a mix of different components and comes in a certain way uh, because the laboratories that are used to test materials that are kind of out of the shelf and it's always the same materials that they test, just maybe different compositions, but this is something new. So we are kind of (laughs) in the middle of that development at the moment. And then it will come as well, of course, testing properly the acoustic properties, which they are quite promising as well, the thermal properties. So it could be used for insulation. Tate and Lyle, for instance, around the Royal Docks. I think you are doing a collaboration with them as well on the factory, these um, former warehouses that they are transforming now at the moment into workshops. And it could be a potential to kind of uh, cover the internal part of those buildings and properly isolate them. So the energy bill that they will have and the embodied camber footprint would be much lower than what it is at the moment. So I think that we can then start looking into applications that can be local and global. And I think that's something quite interesting as well from my end, which which I think is quite uh, fascinating when you see how students work, is that you give them an idea or a starting point and then they 
kind of make that uh, into many different outcomes. So we have now one student that is looking into using recycled 3D printing material, which is called PLA, which is a bioplastic which comes from corn. So all the leftovers of the 3D printers of the university have been collected by this student and then he's looking into melting that leftovers with the bagasse uh, waste material, the sugarcane uh, byproduct, and then kind of creating tiles that could be used for cladding. So they can weather and they can take different conditions in terms of water or sun. So it's uh, starting from one element, which is what we are aiming to, to patent. But now it seems that it's evolving into subcategories, let's say, which obviously they will regard the same effort later on. But it's quite interesting to see that by itself, it becomes something alive in a way that even if you are not doing the work of uh, thinking how it could evolve, there is like a lot of people that at the same time in parallel have interest and are developing that. So for me, that's quite interesting. And I think that something that we are also very keen into testing is how this could come into small prototypes into the market. So we are collaborating with the um, Grimshaw architect developing a prototype where these elements can be used to create the slabs. Normally they, they were doing that test with the stone and with different elements that are uh, with post tension uh, creating flat slabs. So we are looking into replacing the stone with these materials and perhaps why not <laughs> using it as a construction material that are create a slab where you can stand. So we are doing that as an initial testing the material and hopefully that means that it can develop into different strategies and into different results later on. It's interesting, this material is, is throwing up a lot of kind of possibilities. And I think that increasingly the role that materials play is changing. We're looking at the performance of any material in so many more different ways than we used to. I mean, as long as it sort of stood up, it was all right back in the day. But I think it's particularly since the Grenfell disaster, we're, we're looking at materials really, really closely and understanding that this material, it's got structural potential, it's got acoustic potential, it is a vapor open material so that moisture can pass through it so that you're not trapping moisture within the fabric of a building. The more you insulate a building, the more you have to deal with the fact that as a race, we've never produced more moisture in our homes. You know, back in the day, nobody had a dishwasher, whereas now we're chucking moisture into the air constantly, and yet we're sealing our homes up ever more effectively. So that creates indoor air quality problems. So if you start to come up with a material that you can also deal with indoor air quality as well as as well as all the other things it can do you know it's really starting to open the eyes of the students to what the responsibilities of architecture are so yeah i think the the more we dig at this material and the more that we start kind of pushing it around and doing different things with it the greater the awareness is of how it's responding to these various challenges that we're, we're having to put to materials. So yeah, it is a, it's an exciting time, but it's indicative of the responsibility that we all have about how, how we create buildings. They've never been more complicated. So even something that's relatively straightforward, like a slab that you stand on in a building, Grimshaws are desperately trying to work out ways of, of reducing the carbon footprint of it as a material, but also building it up as components so that you don't have to rely on the same old kind of like in situ concrete kind of trucks on the road, waste of carbon story. So, you know, everybody's getting on board with this kind of radical reinvention of, of everything that we thought architecture was made of. And it's really nice to have the students sort of centered on that kind of adventure. I think you just touched on it quite nicely. It comes across with both of you when you speak about the project. What is the importance of the project and the material for yourselves, the industry? What is it about the project that you really like and find so valuable? To me, it's, uh, I, for many years, we have already been working with the students in projects that had a lot of potential, but never got materialized into something tangible because they became just student projects and they ended there. But it's giving the opportunity to an idea that started as part of a student project in a university to become something real, to become something tangible, and to become something that can have an impact both locally and globally. And to me, that transition between academia, student work, research, and practicality, and potentially becoming a construction material that can be used extensively or not, but 
that's not that much the point. It's more about the process that comes from university and becomes something which is, I think, is what university should be doing. It should be about creating and about having an impact into it. And it feels, or it feels to me at least that it tends to be really disengaged, that what happens in university and what happens in industry doesn't kind of come together. And that it seems that everything is already there for you to select and to use, but you cannot have an impact on it. And I think that creating that link between the two to me is very exciting. And for me, it's the first time that I'm involved in a project that is kind of coming from teaching, but then becoming research. And it's something that I have been trying to do for, for a long time and seeing how, how it becomes real is, is very exciting. Yeah, I, I was involved a few years ago through the construction projects with ex-students of ours. I think their first construction week project was building a community shed out of old pallets. And it, was a, it ended up being a really beautiful building. And then fast forward, they've graduated, they support our construction week project. And then they invented a, a kind of self-build timber-based uh, construction system called U-Build. Um, they ended up winning Sustainability Architects of the Year in 2018. And they built a house on Channel 4 grand designs out of this system and that was developed with the students uh, who were participating in prototyping it one-to-one -one and building little buildings with it uh, and eventually just before the pandemic struck um, we used that system to empower the extinction rebellion in Trafalgar Square so it became protest architecture using these boxes to allow people to create structures that means that the, the police can't arrest them because they're two meters up in the air. So I've sort of seen that kind of starting point with students going through that process of setting up their own business, of becoming successful, of innovating, of coming back, bringing the students back on board, and then uh, kind of influencing a, a kind of global XR event. And so, so when you see that happen, you kind of know why you teach, because it creates this kind of cycle of effect. Um, and that was slightly before Armour's time, but but I think it was again seeing this opportunity once more to have the students kind of feeding into this kind of reality loop and making really positive change through their work. It's just really exciting for me. So I, I, I just really, uh, you know, it's kind of why I teach at UEL basically is for these kind of opportunities to come around. That is really wonderful to hear. And it must feel quite a nice job to have, I think. Um, I think we're probably coming up to time but is there one thing that you'd want listeners to know about the project that we haven't yet covered is there one thing that has really captured your heart or something you want to share i just say that i think it's really beautiful all the stuff that the students have come up with you know the textures the color of it it's just it's so nice uh, and so, so it's not like you're kind of being kind of hair shirted about, and, oh, we've got a very sustainable material. Yeah, but it looks like rubbish. No, it actually is very beautiful. And so that's the sort of the icing on the cake. You walk into the lab and you see this whole table covered in these cubes of all different sorts of shapes and sizes and, and the range of colors and they're kind of, oh, they're lovely. And you just think, oh, I want to make a building out of this, you know? And I think that's the really nice bit is that you're not compromising beauty by being kind of pious. You're actually able to produce a material that's really, really lovely and it does a great job. And I think that's the bit that I find really good. I don't know about you, Armand. Definitely. I think that's one fantastic aspect of it that it looks really good. And not only visually, but also to the touch and acoustically. And it creates a very warm atmosphere when we have tested in, in some large panels, which I think it will be probably our next step, just kind of doing something a bit larger in terms of scale. And something perhaps to add to it, which I found quite interesting when we were developing the construction week, uh, which is when we built most of the prototypes, uh, the group of students that we were having, uh, UAE is probably one of the most diverse universities in the UK, if not the most. And we had students that were coming from Nigeria, from Malaysia, from Egypt, uh, from Sri Lanka, all of them working uh, in the same kind of project. And we asked them to think of how that material could be used locally where it's produced. And it was something quite beautiful because all the students were coming from countries where the material was produced and they were thinking about how they could use the material back home. Some of them contacted us saying that they had the opportunity to get in touch with real plantations and to try to promote the material locally. I don't think we are there yet, but just the fact that the students are able to relate it back 
to where they come from and to see how it could benefit their local countries where they might come back or they might not. But if they do, if they come back with an idea of how to reuse waste into something new that could empower them, it's not only us saying this can be done there, but it's them coming back to their places and having something quite unique with them when they when they do. So that kind of social aspect and not only the diversity, but also the empowering the students to, in a way, be a bit different from any other student that just graduated from London and comes with a project. They come with a project, of course, but they come with something else. They come with an idea. They become almost like entrepreneurs by the process because they see that it has a lot of potential where they come from. And we had a couple of students that particularly ask us, can we do this next step? We said, we are still not there, but we will be very happy if they do so when, when the time comes. So hopefully we'll give opportunities for them to develop further into their own countries. What a lovely place to end. Well, thank you, Alan and Amor, for sharing the project with us. If you've enjoyed this conversation and would like to listen to more like this, search for Building Sounds on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your favourite podcast.